Okay, we're having a second. Okay, um, Chrissy, I think if you'd like to start your camera. Great, cool, well, it's three minutes past four, so I think uh, we will make a start. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Patrick Romano, I'm your host for today's event. So welcome all to our first Essence of Excellence event, which is co-hosted by myself. Um, I'm the co-founder and partner at Aerodyne Consulting. And also I have Keith Hunt here, who is a managing partner at Results International. So Keith and I came together um, as both of our organizations um, work with and for high-performing teams. So we're really excited today to be um, welcoming actually my dear friend, Chrissy Wellington, to um, the event and, and, and to, this, um, to, this, to this chat. So just a little bit um, for those who may not know uh, about uh, Chrissy and her uh, many achievements. So Chrissy was a former professional triathlete. She was a four-time Ironman triathlon world champion. She was actually undefeated in all 13 of her races over the Ironman distance. She's the author of two best-selling books, um, an autobiography and also a training manual on, on triathlon. And uh, today, Chrissy is uh, the Global Head of Health and Wellbeing at uh, Parkrun, uh, an organization which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So welcome, Keith, and uh, welcome, Chrissy, to today's talk. We have uh, nearly 50 attendees, uh, both from uh, Aerodyne and from Results International and further afield. So welcome all of you today. Um, so the, um, the event should last until about 10 to 5, um, at which point I'll be opening the floor to questions. So please do type in any questions that you might have um, at the end of the next 45 minutes, and uh, we'll be looking to answer those. Um, or Chrissy will be looking to answer those. I should also <laughs> add that today's event um, is in support of two charities, that is Young Enterprise and SEO London, both organizations that Aerodyne and Results International support that support young people uh, to succeed in life. So welcome, Christy. Great to have you here. Great to see you. Um, it'd be great to be doing this in person, but hey ho. Um, so first of all, I'd like to kick off with a question that relates to um, your journey um, and really to understand a little bit about your story, the story of you. Tell us a little bit about your journey to professional sports, some of the decisions that shaped um, your interest in this area, um, what you think helped you succeed, and maybe some of the key things that you learned along the way. Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to say thanks for inviting me to speak today and thanks to all the attendees. Um, welcome to my dining room. Like you said, Patrick, hope, hopefully one day soon we can do this in person, but at least we can connect virtually. And thanks to everyone also for um, supporting these two incredible charities. It's, um, it's really, really important and really very much appreciated. So my journey, wow, how long do we have? Um, Let's start by winding the clock right back. I think when, when people meet professional athletes, they often assume they've been doing their chosen sport from a very, very young age. And this is definitely the case for some, but not for me. So growing up, I was always competitive. I was driven, I was determined, but I channeled all of these tra traits into my education. So all I wanted to do was to excel academically and then go to university. And I had this incredible passion, if I reflect back at that time, for philanthropy and spent a, lo a lot of time as a youngster trying to raise money 
for causes that I cared about. So growing up in the 80s, this was the Ethiopian famine that kind of gripped the public consciousness, including, I guess, seven-year-old me. So I was active. I did some school sports, I swam for the local team, but for me, it was much about the social side, Patrick, than it was for kind of maximizing any sporting potential. And I think some people have this laser sharp focus on what they wanna be at a very young age and never deviate from that. But it wasn't like that for me. So I, I'm always questioning how did I become world champion? And for me, it was this journey of, very convoluted journey of a million or more steps. And for me, the first stop was university. And I always remember my dad dropping me off on the first day of uni. And he said something quite profound for my dad. And it was seize every opportunity and make your mark on the world for all the right reasons. And it really struck me then. And I tried to live my life by, by those words and that advice. And I still do to this day. Um, and at uni, I focused very much again on the academic side of things. Um, and my goal was to graduate with first class honours. I drank for the swimming club, but I did very little swimming. Um, and then when I graduated, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, a lawyer. And I signed a contract to work for a London law firm. And they agreed that I could take a gap year, a year out to travel around the world before starting work. And my Travels began in Africa. And I think for the first time I saw the beauty of the world, but I also saw this abject poverty and, and deprivation and it ignited this fire in me. And I think that this fire that had been burning since I was a youngster and it precipitated a lot of questions, primarily whether or not law was for me and whether it was the right path and I was speaking to a friend I made in Africa and again she said something that was quite impactful and it was Chrissy look deep inside yourself and work out what your passion really is and it sounds really simple doesn't it but I had to admit I'd never done that yeah. I realized I was following a path um, that was expected of me yeah. and as someone had achieved really good strong academic grades I wanted a label I wanted the validation security that a career in law would give me, but ultimately I wasn't following my passion or my purpose. I think I was trying to, I guess I was trying to conform, mm. you know, I wasn't in doing that. I was kind of performing at life, if that makes sense and not living my authentic life. So anyway, fast forward after a lot of soul searching, I came back from traveling instead of going into law, I did my MA in development economics. And this was the first time in my life that I'd stepped off this path. And stepping off the path is really quite hard. And it was the first time I'd done that. And it wouldn't be the last, but I think it was a really important kind of pivotal moment in my life. And anyway, I did my MA and it was during my MA, a time of quite, quite a lot of academic kind of pressure and stress. I started running and I discounted running as not being for me Patrick because it was uncomfortable I went red I got embarrassed I went even redder um, so it resonates with a lot of people and then on top of that someone told me it wasn't built like a runner so I, I just totally whatever runners built like I totally discounted it but yeah my friend Amy who had grown up with a heart defect had the year before done a London marathon done the London Marathon and I looked at her and I looked at me and I thought what is stopping me and I think there's a golden thread here in terms of role models and influences and things like that that we can maybe touch on later but Amy inspired me I entered the London Marathon I cut my teeth in endurance sports I got injured someone um, I started swimming again to retain fitness someone suggested I do a triathlon and that was really my first foray into triathlon, even never having ridden a road bike. It was simply just a, a, a new and exciting challenge building on um, my, my new passion for running. Um, I took a sabbatical. I was working for the government as a policy advisor on international development. I was working for the government. I took a sabbatical. I went to live and work in Nepal. And I think it was in Nepal that the foundation for my 
athletic career was really built. People think I came from no nowhere, and in fact, you imply that with a question. You know, I, I came out of nowhere, but I think as athletes, as people, we come from somewhere. We're shaped by our environments and our upbringing and, and, the, and the people that su surround us, the opportunities we're presented with. And, and that was the case for me. And I was working in Nepal. I was managing development projects out there. But when I wasn't doing that, I, I was cycling. And I think being in that environment, enduring different, um, uh, you know, di different environments, you know, whether it's cycling through sandstorms when we cycled across the Himalayas to Everest Base Camp or dealing with altitude, altitude sickness, all of those things, they gave me the physical and mental strength that I think I then utilized when I became a professional athlete. Um, just a question on, on this kind of transition, because I think what, I'm, what I sense is that in your journey, there was a kind of uh, a journey from being like focused on giving so you talked about philanthropy at the beginning and then mm -hmm. you know kind of went back to thinking about you and, and and the law degree and then you went to Nepal and started you know kind of giving in but in that in that journey there was there began to be more of a focus on yourself was that because you were kind of getting to know yourself better I mean I I found that my 20s were a lot about that it's about kind of kind of shaking off what it is maybe that your parents are the expectations of you or what society expects of you and just kind of gravitating towards a place where you feel that you can get the balance between those two things. So is that what kind of begun to begun to happen as you were kind of maturing in your in your in your work, if you like, but also beginning to take on some of the the attributes and the interests and the motivations of an athlete? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the essence of life for me is that that process of exploration and continuing to, to challenge myself to seize opportunities. To, to step off the path, to embrace, to embrace the unknown. Um, but definitely, you know, in my 20s, there was a, there was a strong sense that I, I, I wanted to conform mm. and, I, and I needed that, that, that validation of, of, of a career. It wasn't so much the financial security, it was more the validation mm. of um, kind of my academic. Yeah, like realizing, realizing your investment. Uh, yeah. So maybe um, just in terms of kind of the switch from dabbling in, in triathlon, because I, I, maybe this is a caricature in my head, but I, I think I remember you saying when you did your first triathlon, you had like, I don't want to say like tassels and a basket on the bike, but it was like a it running body. <laughs> it definitely wasn't kind of carbon, titanium, you know, plutonium fiber bike. It was, it was a pretty, you know, ramshackle. So was there like a specific point when you remember going like, hang on, I've, I've kind of dabbled with this and I've done a bit of swimming and running and say, but what if I went, you know, kind of fully to the, to the, to the dark side for once, a better word, and just became professional. Do you remember that point in time? I, well, I came back from, I came back from Nepal mm. and, uh, you know, having, you know, built that physical strength, I was determined to kind of put it to good use. So I went back to my job working for the government, mm. but on the side as, you know, recreationally, I wanted to take up triathlon more seriously. So I joined a club, I um, borrowed a bike. Uh, the, the first race were, uh, I'll spare you the sort of details, but I borrowed a wetsuit. Um, it didn't fit. I sang and got rescued by a kayaker. So, like you said, Pedro, it wasn't really auspicious beginnings. But I, I, I being in this, this this kind of cocoon of, of support in this triathlon club really helped. And you know, I got a coach. I trained a lot more seriously and a lot more structured and, and focused and, and increasingly kind of knowledgeable way. And I, I did a number of races, one of which I won and I qualified for the world championships. So, I mean, that's, that's as an amateur. So we have the, the elite level and we have, we have the world, what we call age group championships. So you're participating in your age group. So a long time ago, I was in the 25 to 29 year old age group. So that was the age group I was participating in. So I was combining my full-time job with training 20, 22 hours a week. So um, in advance of the World Age Group Championships, I was training very, very seriously in, in, in a structured and guided way by, by my coach. Um, I went into that race. I was just so proud, Patrick, to wear the GB vest. It was, you know, it was my dream that I didn't even know I had, but a dream come true. Um, 
but I had no experience of racing on the global stage. So I just didn't know where my capabilities lay. My coach either didn't know either or didn't tell me. So I went in free of expectation and just determined to give it everything. And I, I won the world age group championships, both my age group and, and the female race overall. And that was the fork in the road moment for me. And many of, you know, the attendees would have had these forks in the road where you've had to make a decision whether to leave a career or a relationship, move to another country. And at the moment, I guess we're in this middle of this period of incredible uncertainty and instability. And all of that can be incredibly scary because you're stepping from a comfort zone. For me, it was being a recreational athlete, having living in London, having a secure job as a civil servant to the unknown, which was potentially stepping to the world of, of professional sport, which I knew nothing about. And I was so scared. I was scared of ridicule, of not knowing of not being able to make a living of failure whatever that meant and it can be really debilitating and I could have stayed in my comfort zone but then you're left wondering what if mm, yeah. and the fear of not knowing what might be around the corner is more scary to me than you know the possibility of, of failure or ridicule so I, I never want to be left wondering and I never want to think what if. So that was the point, I think, having won the World Championships uh, as, a, as an amateur, that I realised my potential and I, quite late in life, I was 30, which is kind of, you know, pensionable age for, for an athlete, really. Um, I, I, took that, I took that step, but it, it wasn't an easy step to make because like I said the, the unknown is is really scary but the worst is not knowing isn't it it's, it's weird that I mean it's quite funny because I, I had a similar junction in my life when I was 30 I'd, I'd been an academic since virtually what felt like the beginning of time and then at 30 I was like okay I, I need I need more security and also you know if I don't do it now I'll, I'll feel like I'm kind of over the hill but it's it's interesting you know in 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 the transition that I made, it was kind of like a, quite a smooth spectrum, right? In terms of you earn X and then you kind of move to another place and you probably earn a little bit more. And then, you know, it's relatively safe, right? But I guess, I guess as an athlete, there must be a lot of athletes that kind of make that decision to, you know, abandon the security or the, or, you know, versus the safety, if you like, of a, a, something they may not enjoy. Um, and, but that they're, they're kind of comfortable with versus saying, I'm going to jump all the way to the other side and to, you know, to have a meaningful income and to have meaningful security was, was your, I mean, it seems to be interesting that you were, you know, you would, you would, you enjoyed sport and I guess you were kind of driven to win. Um, and you were, I guess, kind of naturally quite competitive, but did you feel that you had to kind of up your level of, of commitment of competitiveness? Because if you didn't, if you didn't win, your security would, your financial security would really be at risk. So were you driven by the need to actually, you know, place yourself high enough to have a, a meaningful return on, on the risk that you were taking? Yeah, I think whenever you, you take the decision, whether there's what I call like a fork in the road yeah. moment, it, it's not simply a case of kind of stepping off a cliff, or some, for some people it might be, but for me it wasn't. So it's a, a, a managed risk. Are you, yeah. you use the term, I'm sure, control the controllables. So financially, there was there was a risk because I didn't know how I was going to make a living, but I knew I had a certain amount of funds to cover me for a certain amount of, of time and I budget it. And you do all the things to, to kind of minimize the risk of you running out of money in, in, in two months time and, and maximizing the chances that you can, you know, succeed over, over the course of, of that year. I didn't leave my job. I took a sabbatical an unpaid sabbatical, which gives you kind of that, that safety net, even though I think deep down, I knew I probably wouldn't go back to that job, but it gives you that, that safety net of knowing that it's there. Yeah. Um, I did seek the advice of a, of the man that was to become my, my first coach, a very, very interesting character, it turns out, but I sought his advice. So I went 
to him um, for a week of or kind of a trial week, I guess, yeah. um, in in the January, where you know, whereby he could take a take a, a look at me and see whether he thought I had what it took to to make it or make a living as a professional mm-hmm. athlete. And his judgment actually was physically you have, but men, you know, I'm gonna need to cut your head off, which was a <laughs> I guess a slightly yeah. macabre way of telling me that I had had a bit of work to do to get a handle on the kind of psychological side of things. But so I, I guess you know when you're 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 making a decision about a, a, a you know a transition in your life, I, I did it in a, in a managed way. Yeah. yeah. But, but it was. Ultimately, it was a leap into the unknown. It was it was a sport I knew very little about. That I was a relative novice in an environment. You know, you know, professional sport is is a is a is, it was just an incredibly different environment to one I've ed, I'd ever experienced before. So, just um, in terms of um, just in terms of that, that that kind of transition over, like one one of the one of the elements that I'm interested in exploring is kind of goal setting. So you know how did how did the the, the kind of the, the size and shape and, and management of your goals change when you kind of moved out of you know your your twenties and, and into into your kind of professional triathlete career? Tell me a little bit about that that kind of mindset shift in terms of what a what a goal meant and, and how that goal could be achieved. As as a young person. My my goal was wedded to to academic mm-hmm. excellence. So so my goal was very clear. Um, I um, very early on in, in my university career career, I, you know, achieving a first class honours was what I I aspired to. And even prior to that, you know, A grade at, at A level was was what I. You know, I'd set my my mind and heart on, and and dedicated everything to to achieving that. It was it was very clear, and it was wedded to to academic excellence, and and sport was definitely something that I did for fun. So I I I I didn't aspire to um, uh, achieve any kind of sporting success as a, a as a as a youngster. I was quite happy, kind of bimbling along, you know, doing it like I said, as much for the social side. Um, and then during my career as a civil servant, you know, again, I, I was very ambitious and, and had, you know, the ambition of, of moving up the civil service ranks and assuming more responsibility. Um, but it was interesting that, that that stepping off the path to, to move to Nepal was the first time I'd actually taken um, or decided um Maybe to revise to revise my goal, so it wasn't necessarily climbing up the ladder. Because at that point, when I moved to Nepal, the the UK government was assuming the presidency of the GA and the EU. So my role, I I would have personally assumed, uh, you know, a lot more responsibility, um, and my, my role would have been uh, assumed a lot more prominence. But I knew intuitively, and I think intu- intuition is incredibly powerful and probably underrated. Intuitively, I knew that I wanted to gain some experience working in development on the ground. And so that's, I stepped off the path and maybe that became, a, a, it was a different, a different goal to, to the one I had before. And then when I became a, a professional athlete, my goal was to try and get to the Olympics. Mm. Uh, so I became a professional athlete in 2007. The Olympics were in Beijing, 2008. So those that you know, may not be familiar with the different distances in triathlon, you obviously have you have the sprint distance, very short. But the Olympic distance, which is the one as you might imagine, is the one at the Olympics, and then you have Ironman, which is the longest and most masochistic of all. Um, I wanted to focus on the Olympic distance because Ironman was for stupid crazy people and incomprehensible to me um and it was my first coach that basically was the bearer of bad news and said because you're not good enough yeah and i think that was the first time that i felt that i'd had my i don't know I, my dream good was enough, not good enough for the olympics not good not enough. Good my strong my uh, i'll spare you the details of why but it is uh, it's to do with that my strength in the swim was not sufficient to to be competitive at that 
distance, whereas it, the swim assumes a lot less kind of importance proportionally in, in the Ironman distance. So it wasn't as much of a weakness. Right. Um, and so for the first time, I think I, I, I think my, my dream was shattered. Mm-hmm. And without me realizing, it was, my, it was my coach that set a new goal for okay. me. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he saw a talent in me that I hadn't seen in myself. Mm. That brings me um, on, Casey. I was going to ask you about teamwork in your career because, you know, most successful sports people and business people have, have achieved what they've achieved to some degree with a team behind them. And just listening to you talking there about the coach and the advice they're giving you, I guess you must have had a different teams with you along the journey. And that must have been quite a, a change, really, in terms of the way you worked in that from being this sort of individual borrowing a bike to having a team behind you and how did you how did you work with that how did you manage it how do you pick people how do you drop people when they're not good enough oh god Keith it was incredibly hard I think people people see triathlon as an individual sport and that's (laughs) part of it (laughs) that that was the appeal to me I I like the concept of you know everything being down to me and my responsibility and in some respects it is an individual sport in that we race as individuals and it's kind of my responsibility as an athlete to execute in training and on race day but you're right I I mean I never got to the start line let alone the finish line alone and as a as a triathlete in all walks of life but as a triathlete I I was part of a a really strong collective, a team. And I think initially it was really, really difficult for me to trust people with my career. And I think if I reflect back, it was, there was a a really strong fear of letting go, a fear of losing control, of entrusting others with my dreams. But I, I had to fear a little bit less. And again, it was my first coach that made me realize that my responsibility was to focus on swimming, cycling and running and executing that. And I had to build a team around me that could provide the support in all the other areas. And, and my team comprised my coach. And maybe we can touch on this, it might come up in the Q&A, but I had two coaches in my career and they both had completely different styles, but they were able to develop a program to suit me and really importantly to evolve it over time. So as an athlete and as as a winning athlete, I was so, it was so hard for me to to adapt what I was doing and to evolve because you, you have a recipe for success and you're scared that if you kind of veer away from that, then everything comes crumbling down. So having a coach around me enabled me to nuance and evolve my program over, over time. Um, so yes, my coaches, um, my family and friends, so important for emotional support as, as much as anything. My, my manager, or my agent who, yes, enabled me to make a career out of the sport I loved, but also kind of acted almost like as a, as a bodyguard by minimizing all the external pressure. So enabling, again, enabling me to focus by limiting the number of commitments I had or managing, um, you know, kind of media requests, things like, things like that. So I could focus on my performance. My sponsors, they were part of my team because obviously they enabled me to to make a living but in the provision of all the equipment and kit they they they, um they provided me with what i needed to to compete um what about um, sorry sorry chrissy what what about so when i think of a you know our team i think also the like kind of your peers right so almost like the triathlete community around you so you know you're competing against them but you're also kind of I guess like a community in a way and there's a maybe a sense of being in it together what what role did they play in in kind of supporting you in a in a weird way did, did, did you find that that community and that people that group of people that are going through a similar thing that you were yeah. as being as important as your kind of like obvious yeah I mean, great question um 
initially I found it incredibly hard. So I, I, I was a member of a triathlon team. I came in as a rookie and I, it, it felt like being a new girl at school, Patrick. I mean, I, I felt ostracized, excluded, mm. and, and I was deliberately, my, my coach kind of engineered that <laughs> as well and fueled this fire in me. Um, but the, the relationships of my teammates changed after I'd won the, the world championships and, and that kind of dynamic <laughs> kind of shifted. Um, but having the opportunity to train with my competitors uh, elevated all our performances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a, there was a camaraderie, there was a, a mutual support, there was a recognition that we wanted to raise people at their best. Mm -hmm. And to raise people at their best, meaning meant having training partners, sometimes training, you know, together and, and bringing out the best in each other. And, and, and triathlon, um, there, there's, there's a strong sense of that, you know, and we look at the meaning of competitor, the word, and it means striving together. And that's what we did. I mean, I've got a number of photos I wish I could show you of, you know, in an Ironman race, in the heat of battle, you know, you've got you know, me tapping someone else on the back as I go past them, someone doing it to me, you know, just being, giving each other thumbs up. So I think we recognize that we're all kind of in it together. It's an arduous endurance sport. Um, there's a lot of respect yeah. um, and there's a strong sense that we want to support each other to be the best that we can be so that we know that we're, we're racing people, you know, that are the height of their kind of powers. I, I remember one of um, one moment, which I'm sure is on YouTube somewhere, where I don't know if it was your last race or your second last race, where you got a puncture and one of your, you know, one of the competing athletes stopped to give you one of those little um, little gas gas canisters to fill your wheel. That was just like just an incredible moment of kind of sportsmanship, and I can't imagine what it must have been like for you. And, and I think you probably went on to overtake that that poor person that had given you the <laughs> gas canister. So. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine kind of the emotions that are wrapped in, in those moments and that sense of kind of working with, basically with other people and, and working together to, to kind of, um, in, you know, enhance everybody's performance. So one, one, one thing I want to... It's a sport, isn't it? And, and I think as we've been driven apart in this past year, the importance of connection and, and being yeah. together and supporting one another has really come to the fore. Yeah. And I think if that's one thing this year's taught us, it's taught us many things, but that is the importance of those rich, meaningful connections. And we do need that interaction and we do need that that support of of others. And and for me, tri triathlon gave me a great gift. It gave me many gifts, but it gave me that gift of, of really strong relationships. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and it's I, I'm blessed to have had that. Just while we're on the subject of kind of this year, one, one of the topics that comes up a lot is, is resilience. And, um, and uh, again, I, I, I remember some of the war stories. I think this was before your last race where you'd had a bike accident like a couple of weeks before the main event. And I think you'd either fractured a clavicle and then I think you described having kind of looking like a pizza down one side of your body from road rash. Um, and then just like happily going in, you know, to, into salt water. God knows how much pain there was in that. Um, but tell us a little bit about, I, I always, you know, the burning question is like, how do you deal with the pain? I remember another story you mentioned was that your coach had once put you, you know, in the basement on a treadmill and said, without any windows and said, go, go and, you know, go and run a marathon and I'll see you in a couple of hours kind of thing. So yeah, like where does, where does that come from? And, and maybe how have you kind of, have you harnessed or where did that come from? And have you harnessed, have you had to re-harness some of that over the last year, given, given the conditions in terms of managing managing pain and, and, and managing, you know, that level of stress. Yeah, I, I, I love how, how these stories take on the stuff of, of legends. Um, <laughs> maybe I, I, embellishment there. I'd, I like, I'd like to say that I, um, I raced with a broken clavicle. Maybe, um, maybe that can be the new narrative, but no, definitely. A um, clavicle or a femur, one of those. No. <laughs> 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 I was in my hospital bed on the start. <laughs> no, I, I, you're right. I, I mean, I, as with any journey, there are always lows, mm. so 
blows that you have to encounter, injury, illness, um, bad races when things don't go according to plan. And yeah, I came off my bike two weeks before the World Championships and you're right, I did look like I'd kind of been annihilated by a cheese grater down the left side of, of my body and I pulled my pectoral muscle. It could have been a broken capital, who knows? Um, but anyway, I, I, I went into that race um, and I had to utilize all of the kind of psychological strategies. And, and we think sport is a, you know, a very physical <laughs> endeavor and it, and it is, but especially uh, any sport, but especially endurance sport, you need to endure. And with that comes kind of a, the, the kind of psychological side of things. So how do I deal with pain or discomfort? Um, I think first and foremost, I embrace it. And that sounds slightly masochistic, doesn't it? But I expect it and I embrace it so it doesn't scare me. Mm. Um, and I, so, I, so I reframe it through a different lens. So instead of it being something that I fear, it's something that I expect and, and, and embrace. So it's, it's a sign that I'm testing myself, that I'm pushing my limits um and so i think if i if i went into an ironman race thinking what well, this isn't really gonna hurt you know i'm setting myself up for a fall i haven't prepared myself psychologically so when the pain and discomfort strikes i'm not fearful of it i stay i stay with it if if that makes sense um for me and it sounds very cliche but positivity is very important so having having a mantra um remembering my my not my goal necessarily but remembering my motives smiling was always really really important um i i drew a lot on kind of music and poems like rudyard kipling's if yeah is something that i kind of recalled a lot when i was racing um i try in training and in racing to to divide it into to shorter segments. So if you think about an Ironman, you know, 140 or so miles, that that's daunting and inconceivable to anyone, whether or not you're a professional athlete. So you just think, right, I've got to get through the swim start, then I've got to get to the first boy, then the next, then I get on my bike and you break the bike segment down into chunks and then the marathon, you're breaking it into what, 5K, 10K or you know, the next person, the next aid station. So you're just breaking it down because the analogy of the mountain, you don't think about the top, you think about that next step. Yeah. And it's the same with, a, same with a race. So you very much break it down and you stay in, a mo in the moment. Um, and then for me, the power of recollection is really, really important. Just every single race I ever did, including those I won, I wanted to quit. I thought that I wasn't going to a be able to, to, to finish. And I, I dealt with that in the moment and then I went on to win. And that, that power of recollection, the power of memory of times when you've overcome adversity is really, really important. And we've all been there. We've, you know, where we've all encountered some kind of adversity or challenge or pain or discomfort in our lives and we've endured it and we've overcome, even in the moment we thought we couldn't. And that's really, really powerful. And I think it reminds me that, that we are capable of, of so much more. And um, when I'm racing, I, I do recall those, those previous moments when I have endured um, and that helps me do so. That's great. Again, I think it's reframing, like reframing things through a different lens, isn't it, Patrick? That's I mean, you, you can see bad races as bad races or as failures, or you can see them, for me, they've been amazing learning opportunities. Yeah. There've been times when I've realized how I haven't prepared, what I can do better, and, I've used them almost as 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 a springboard, or or injury was a was my body's way of telling me no, you're not you're not training in the right way. With my coach, we need to nuance things. I think there's um, there's plenty of lessons there, and I, I would agree. Power of recollection, you know, it's something that I try to 
kind of drill into my kids. And you, you have to have a few a few cuts and bruises that, you know, can help you through the next time you're in that situation. So, um, yeah. yeah, very strong on Keith, I think. Yeah, I agree. We, I think we, we've all been there, or a lot of us have been there. And, <laughs> and having, you talked a bit about springboards and framing, of course, after you did the perfect race, you that was kind of the springboard to do something new. And you've talked quite a bit about forks in the road as well, but they, this was a massive, you know, to, to step away from something which had been your life for so many years, which had made you famous and, all those sort of things to then decide you were going to do something else. Um, how, how did you cope with that new challenge? And the, I guess it was scary again, like the first one. So interested to know, firstly, if that last race hadn't been perfect, would you still have retired? And then, yeah. um, and then how did you cope with the challenges and uncertainty of moving on from there? Yeah, it's been lots of those forks in the road. It's a bit like a tree, isn't it, if I think about it. It's loads of changes I've made in my life this this was probably the the most the most significant one um the race in 2011 well 10 years ago now was I think the race I've always craved um largely due to to the to to what happened in in the lead up to it you know it's it's the race where I dug to the very, very depths. So I had the battle with my competitors. So I wasn't in the lead very early on. Um, I had to really fight with my competitors, but also that, just as importantly, that battle within. And for the very first time, I entered a race that I thought I wasn't going to win. Mm. And for me, that was really hard because I became over the course of my career, scared of losing. I was really fearful of losing. And I went into the, this race facing that fear and being prepared not to win. And I crossed the finish line and I won and I was absolutely annihilated. And like you said, I've described it as my perfect race and, and not because everything went perfectly but precisely because it didn't. And in a way, I overcame all of the imperfections in the lead up and during the race perfectly. And that's why that, that race, it completed me. I think I achieved more than I ever thought possible. But in, in winning that race, I think I answered all the questions I'd ever asked of myself as an athlete. And I knew that then, at that point, I was worthy of being a champion, being called a champion. And I knew then that, although I was still winning, that there was no more room. Um, I think no more room to grow. Mm. So your question about would I have retired had I not won? Probably not. But I think having won... I felt liberated. Mm. I, 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 I can't put it any other way. I felt liberated and, and intuitively again, I knew that I had to step off the path. But as you said, change is so hard. I went from having an identity that was wedded to a public persona and, and the accolades and the financial security and the elation and jubilation of you know the addiction of, of crossing that finish line in in first place I had a, a focus and a structure and a routine and all those things I love mm. and then I didn't know who I was I didn't know who who I was if I wasn't Chrissy Wellington Ironman world champion and we live in a world rich with labels you know whether it's our profession or our qualifications or our marital status and I, I didn't even know I didn't know where I was going to live I didn't know what I was going to do with my days and again I was stepping into the unknown but I think experience again we talk about recollection experience told me that that's where the beauty happens although it doesn't seem so at the time that's where the growth happens and I had to be comfortable sitting in that place where I didn't have the answers, if that made sense. 
And then again, you go through a process, which you maybe talk about, but of finding your new passion and your new purpose and your new goal and your new way of being. Um, but it, yeah, it guess, wasn't easy. I, I guess the, the you know as 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 an athlete, there is an inevitability to it, though, that you know you you come to the stage where. Yeah. You know, either because you've literally like won everything that <laughs> there is to win, and you know, in your case, you kind of ran a perfect race, and maybe that was kind of the, the climax, or because you have no choice, because physically or mentally you can't, you can't kind of keep up with the rest of the pack. So I guess you would, you know, you would have had some time to prepare for it as well. So I'm just conscious of time because we've it's it's uh, touching ten to five. Um, maybe for those um, who, who don't know, you know, to, who Chrissy Wellington is today. Uh, can tell us a little bit about your your role at Parkrun and 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 I guess how you've kind of refocused your motivations and and, you, and your skills to um, you know to, to that organisation and, and tell us a bit about where it is today and maybe some of the plans for for the future and then in a, just so maybe three yeah. minutes and then we'll we'll cut to uh, some yeah no, I'm I'm happy if you are just to, to go slightly over but yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't an easy segue from being an athlete to partner, and I don't want to make it sound easy, just but just for time, um, there was a lot of introspection, exploration, wow. networking, reading, thinking, and a serendipitous encounter brought me into contact with the founder of Part Run, and I was explaining to him that I had this passion for, you know, empowering people through physical activity, and my idea was to... Um, uh, start my own charity, um, kind of encouraging children to take part in sport and physical activity. And he said, well, Chrissy, as it happens, we want to roll out the, the Judea Park Run series of events. So those that don't know, Park Run is a non-profit organisation that delivers free weekly 5K events in areas of open space in over 2,200 locations around, around the world. And I came on board initially with them in 2013 to develop the Junior Park Run series. So this is a series of 2K events for four to 14 year olds held every Sunday morning in over 280 events um, in England, um, over 360 across, across the UK and they've been rolled out in Ireland and Australia too. Um, my role is to develop interventions informed by insight to engage those that are less active in our event. So it's very easy, as we all know, to encourage people that are already active to do more sport or to do a different type of sport. But what we really want to see is a healthier and happier and more connected world and we feel that to do that, we need to encourage those that are that are less active and or who have you know, poorer levels of, of health and well-being to take part in our events, whether they walk, whether they run, whether they come along and volunteer. So my role is to develop interventions to um, uh, maximise the, the opportunities for them to, to participate by reducing barriers to, to participation that that they may face. Um, so every every weekend prior to COVID, we had about 330,000 people take part in part runs every weekend, about 170,000 every weekend across the UK. And they were closed due to COVID. They're reopening in various countries around the world. Junior Park Run is now reopened in, in, in reopening in England, and we're looking to reopen 5K Park Runs in England on on the 5th of, 5th of June, but you know, I feel incredibly blessed to be able to make what is an incredibly selfish pursuit in professional sport. I mean, it's pretty trivial, isn't it? Um, professional sport, it's pretty pointless. Um, but in doing it, you can create for yourself a platform and an opportunity. And I feel really really blessed to have been a triathlete because it's afforded me that that platform to now do something that I'm incredibly passionate about and that's using physical activity um, to empower people and to promote much better health and well-being and I just think never has this been more important than it is now. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Just, just looking quickly beyond that Chrissy and um, 
you've achieved an awful lot in your life already and then you've moved on to part run. So what's in the bucket list? Is this is there, is there anything else out there that you haven't done and you want to do? Oh gosh. Yeah, my bucket list is full to overflowing as you, as you yeah. might as you might imagine. Um, it's been tempered. Um, when children come along, I think it changes your bucket list slightly. Um, my, my personal bucket list very much we'd love when the time is is right to go traveling as a family when when our daughter was nine months old we did a around the world trip for for two months and obviously she doesn't remember any of it we remember so much and it, and it was just it was just incredible so it would be it would be wonderful to to be able to take her on a on a on, on another trip that that she'd hopefully remember and internalize um Again, personally, a sporting bucket list. It wouldn't be me if I didn't have a sporting bucket list. I've really enjoyed getting into ultra running inspired by, by Patrick. So a bucket list event would be UTMB, which is the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc, about 140 miles around Mont Blanc. So that's a definite, definite bucket list for me. And, and then professionally, you know, I, my, my focus is on maximizing my impact at, at, at Park Run. And, and if I could aspire to connect every Park Run event with a GP practice in the UK and around the world, as we're starting to do, that would, you know, be a bucket list achievement um, for, for me and, and for us as an organization. So definitely have kind of personal and, and professional professional goals and I'm sure I'll I'll keep adding adding to them especially as things open up now and the opportunities arise thanks Chrissy um good good combination of of, of, uh, of goals there um so we've got six or seven minutes now I'm just going to encourage if you haven't uh, put a question in the Q&A yet to please uh, fire away we've got two or three here um, I'm going to pick one which is um, very, very serious. So someone says, Simon McCready says he used to work with someone who was in the GB triathlon squad. And he said the swim was always a nightmare because others would pull the zip down on your wetsuit to slow you down. Um, there's obviously many metaphors uh, associated with that. But is, is, that, is that true or false? Is that something I've experienced? Yeah. I've, I've, I've never had my own zip. Okay. Um, Did you unzip or were you unzipped? <laughs> I've, I've never done the unzipping, but that, that could be a good tactic. <laughs> um, I learned some dirty tactics. I used to play a bit of water polo, actually. Um, I learned a few dirty tactics with water right. polo, which do come in handy. But de no, definitely, the, the start of a triathlon swim is not for the faint-hearted. So <laughs> it's kind of a pub, aquatic pub brawl. Um, <laughs> limbs flailing everywhere. Because, I mean, we the professional athletes have it relatively easy because there may be a hundred of us so you can get a little bit of open space but yeah, yeah, yeah. at the amateur ranks back at, you know there's about two thousand people all That's piling cool. on top of each other yeah, um man. like lemmings and, and just you know there's punches being thrown and apparently wetsuits being being just pulled off so oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you've I've had goggles pulled off and and things like that, and it's it's what you need to prepare for. And going back to what we said before, you fear that, and you know it's going to happen to you, and it'll throw you into a loop. So you almost expect it. You practice it in training, where you get someone to give you a quick right hook, and you've got to deal with it, and then you feel a lot more prepared. Yeah. So the second question, we've got five minutes left. Um, so Diala, um, who is uh, on my team, actually asked a great question. Um, what was your biggest failure? Uh, because obviously there's huge successes and how did you overcome it? In, in a sporting context, mm. um, I wouldn't necessarily say it was a failure, but I failed to reach, well, it probably was, I failed to reach the Olympics. Okay. That was my goal. My goal was to try and qualify for the Olympics and I simply wasn't good enough. And um, you could argue that I, I could have kept trying, but time wasn't on my side and age wasn't on my side. And also I think I was aspiring to something that I just didn't have 
the aptitude mm. to achieve. And I didn't want to go to the Olympics and come 40th. You yeah. know, I wanted to be at the pointy end. And so how I dealt with that was with the help of my coach to transition into a sport that, or a discipline that, that I, I had a talent for, even though I didn't appreciate it at, at, the, at the time. So I, I didn't qualify for the Olympics, but in retrospect, it wasn't my biggest failure. It was probably the springboard to yeah, success. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have succeeded um, in the Olympics, but yeah, I was able to achieve. It was almost like Olympic triathlon, I'll show you. Um, yes. This is yeah. Olympic. You and your puny 10K run, don't make me laugh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's a couple, few more questions coming in. Maybe we can just make them bite-sized answers. Um, so oh, David yeah. McVeigh asked, if you could go back to speak to the Chrissy heading into professional sport, what would you tell her? Knowing what you know 10, 15 years later. Anything is possible and you are good enough. Yes, very, very inspiring. Um, <laughs> another question here from uh, Mr. Anonymous at Attendee. Do you feel school <laughs> prepared you for the hard work? School? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of the traits that I demonstrated at school um, the drive, the discipline, the organization, the dedication, the obsession, <laughs> single-minded focus on the pursuit of a goal. I channeled those into different um, activities. So whether that was ac academia or then sport, absolutely. Um, I think that they were great that served me well. Next question is Paul, from Paul Davidson. What was, I, what was your cheat meal, if any, during training? I don't know what that is. It's, it's in speech. I could go to, I could go to well, my, my pre-race meal was um, a culinary masterpiece. <laughs> tuna pasta. Yeah. <laughs> tuna, yeah. Tuna pasta. But I was better, well, more well-known for my post-race um, eating. Oh, yeah. Kind of, yeah, prowess, you know, burgers and chips, everything. And just kind of anything fatty and salty, I was... <laughs> I was but also, sorry, back to the other question. I should have said, actually, I, I feel that having achieved, um, having gained some kind of academic qualifications served me well post-sport. So I think that one worry of concern of mine is that people getting in, children getting into sport at a very young age. Um, and it could be to the detriment of kind of being a, a well-rounded youngster and then when you come out of professional sport you need something it might not necessarily be an academic qualification but I think having achieved at school then equipped me to cope with a life post-sport mm -hmm. okay cool um it's five o'clock <laughs> Keith I don't know if you were sorry <laughs> any, any more final questions I, I unfortunately have got a hard stop now. Which, yeah, uh, I think I think we should uh, allow, yeah. allow everybody. There's, just, to there's loads of great questions here, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, I'm sorry we can't answer them all. But I just wanted to say yeah, a few. round two, round two. Sorry, yeah, might maybe, yeah, we could definitely, yeah, we could do part two. I'd, I'd be well up for that. I'm sure Keith would as well. Yeah, definitely, it's been great. <laughs> but I just wanted to finish by saying thank you so much, Chris. It's been really fantastic spending an hour with you. I feel I know we, I know we see each other quite often, but I, I feel quite spoiled to be able to kind of give you the some of the more formal questions, and uh, I'm sure Keith feels the same. Uh, it's been you know a really fascinating journey into into your wonderful um, you know career and, uh, and and all of those lessons that I think are so transferable um, you know across any any kind of uh, life setting. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Chrissy. Thank you so much. Um, this has been recorded, so it will be available on our Diamond Insights TV channel as well, Aerodyne. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. All the best, and thank uh, I'll see you soon. Thanks, Keith. Thanks to our attendees. Thank you. Okay. Bye, 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 everybody.